Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of a company that's about four years old, and we are still in stealth mode. Um, but Damien asked me to come here and describe what we're doing, and I think this is a great opportunity to do so. Every once in a while, a revolutionary technology comes along that changes everything. And while we are in stealth mode, I will be introducing to you a revolutionary product that, as Damien said, we believe changes the concept of mass transit. And this is going to be a little different than probably what you might be expecting. We're talking about mass transit because cities around the world are in crisis, and it's only getting worse as urbanization continues. Because everybody goes to work and comes home at the same time, transportation demand during commuting hours vastly exceeds the capacity of road infrastructure. In order to meet commuting demand, mass transit was invented. However, only one technology has ever been successfully deployed to meet demand of moving a huge population of people in a short amount of time. And that technology is rail technology invented 200 years ago. That's it. And the problem with rail is that it is too expensive to build and even more expensive to operate. Every mass transit train on Earth loses money. And not everybody knows that. Every mass transit train on Earth costs more to operate than you ever collect at the ticket uh, by selling a ticket. In the US, taxpayers make up the gap. In other countries, like here in Hong Kong, uh, other business models subsidize the transportation costs. But the staggeringly high cost of rail means that we can't build enough to meet demand, not even close. And that's why we have traffic congestion, which I think we can all relate to. What we are introducing is a vision of mass transit that represents, we believe, nothing short of an industrial revolution. Glideways is a mass transit system that can move more people than rail using less than half of the space and costs 90% less. And we are profitable with high margins using uh, at fares uh, that exist today, at existing mass transit fares. And we do this with a better than private car experience. We accomplish this through our fundamental insight that doing the exact opposite of a train actually increases capacity and decreases costs. And the way we do that is we disaggregate mass transit. Instead of cramming everybody into a train or a bus, we give everybody their own vehicle on demand. And I'll show you how. But what's more, this fundamental insight drives an entirely new business model that allows us to open up two markets and not just one. In addition to buyers of mass transit systems today, cities, governments, and municipalities, we can also sell to the private sector, smaller communities, private developments, large enterprises who also need transportation services. That's opened up a whole new market. Frankly, we don't even know how big this market is. And we can deliver all of this today using commodity technology that you can buy off the shelf. By the way, we are a team of engineers and designers, not marketers, so please pardon the rawness of what you're about to see.
So what you just saw was entirely counterintuitive, that by giving everybody their own vehicle on demand in a point-to-point -point transportation scenario where there's no stopping, no ride sharing, and no interchanges, you can actually decrease costs and vastly increase throughput capacity. But not only is it counterintuitive, it's also entirely different from what the entire automotive industry and venture capital industry is doing today, which is purely chasing autonomous vehicle technology. But simply replacing the driver of a vehicle, be it a bus or a car, with a computer completely misses the point. Road infrastructure is extremely capacity limited. It doesn't matter what you put on the road and who is driving, the physics do not change. You still have pedestrian crossings which require you to stop the flow of traffic. You have intersections and other bottlenecks that inhi inhibit capacity. Now, this newest nuanced observation has missed the automotive industry and is entirely our opportunity, because this is what our value proposition is. It is mass transit, but it is profitable mass transit. That is something the world hasn't seen since before World War I. It's been nearly 100 years since the last mass transit system ever actually turned a profit. In fact, our economics are so powerful that we can lower the price of mass, mass transit to below fares that they are today, down to one US dollar per ride, and still have EBITDA margins north of 40%. That's what we're about. The status quo is one we're all familiar with. Riders are abandoning mass transit, generally speaking, either due to lack of access because there isn't enough mass transit where people live, or because the experience is so terrible, people would much rather sit in traffic in their own vehicle than take a mass transit system, and particularly in the United States. And so what we actually have to do is create something that invites more people onto mass transit. So it's both an economic access and experience value proposition. The way we think about it is that our, our, our value proposition put a different way is that we are the best mass transit solution for any given space. When we say we can move more people than a train, what we mean is that in a bike lane of space, one and a half meter lane, we can move 10,000 people per hour. That's as much as a train can do in roughly five times that space. Or put another way, it's a highway in a bike lane. 10,000 people per hour is roughly a five-lane highway at its theoretical maximum capacity. And we can do that in about half of a car lane. Our system is scalable. And this is kind of neat because this is where the business model power really is revealed. By disaggregating mass transit down to the individual user, it means that our unit economics, the dollars per person per kilometer traveled, are the same regardless of the size of the system. Not so for any other system. Buses and trains, if they're underutilized, the economics fall off a cliff. But if we're profitable at the city level, inherently we're gonna be profitable at the private, private campus or private development level. That is really powerful, because that has allowed us to bifurcate our customer base into two groups, public and governments and municipalities, but also private enterprises, companies like Facebook and developers that are building large, multi-hundred hectare uh, communities that are both residential and commercial. On top of that, we can repurpose any running service. We don't require rails or third rails or induction charging or any of those infrastructurally expensive technologies. We're four rubber tires on concrete. Kind of a solved problem, something we know how to do. And speaking about the vehicle, our team is ex-Apple, ex-Tesla, and ex-Google, and that means that we're trained to start with the user experience. We design the user experience first before we do anything else, and we refine it to an art form, and then we engineer it. And so it starts with the vehicle. That is the primary interface and in how we interact with our customers. Our vehicle is super simple. It's one seat wide, which means it's about a meter wide. It's electric. It is autonomous. However, our vehicles operate on closed lanes meaning we don't interface with other traffic. Our lanes are closed. You can't walk on it, you can't bicycle on it, and certainly no other cars can go on it, only our vehicles, just like a train, incidentally, and you do that for capacity. But because our lanes are closed, it means that the autonomous technology we require is not level five, which no one on Earth has actually invented yet, and you can't go buy it commercially yet. The technology we need for, for autonomous piloting has been around for 20 or 30 years. Think of any airport interterminal train. It's the same technology. 
it's been around for decades. Our vehicles also don't go very fast. Our top speed is 50 kilometers per hour, or 30 miles per hour. And the reason we don't go very fast is we don't need to because of one of our technologies that we deploy, which is called continuous flow. And what that means is that once you get in the vehicle and the doors close and you hit the go button, the vehicle never, ever stops until it gets to your destination. It doesn't even slow down. So if you never stop, speed is now less important. That has an economic impact because my battery pack, my power electronics, and all the other drivetrain and powertrain uh, technologies are not designed for high speed. They're designed for fairly low speed, back to commodity hardware that we can buy off the shelf. So our vehicle is a commodity vehicle. Nothing in the vehicle is new, none of it's proprietary, and we don't produce it. And in the same way we don't produce our vehicle, we also don't produce the infrastructure. I mentioned to you we operate on bike lane sized infrastructure because that's what we designed it to do. And the reason we did that is bike lane infrastructure is awfully inexpensive. Infrastructure companies around the world can produce bike lanes at grade, above grade, below grade. It's a known science. It's also a commodity product, very well understood, and the prices are very stable. It's also prefabricated and modular, which means you can build very, very, very quickly. It also means that our surfaces are reversible to pedestrian surfaces or bike lane surfaces. In other words, if you deploy a glideway system and you decide to change your mind, you can reverse the investment in infrastructure back to pedestrian or bicycle lane infrastructure. This is, for us, has been a big deal with our customers because it reduces the risk to buying something even if it's 90% cheaper. We can also build incredibly fast. All of our components for the infrastructure, the worst case, the raised infrastructure that you can see in the bottom image on the slide, which is really the most expensive worst case, all of it fits in a standard shipping container, which means you can truck everything on site. No need for heavy cranes, no need for first building the concrete factory to pour the concrete and then lift it in place. And you leverage prefabrication. And this is done already around the world. And with that in mind, there's really four ways to build. You can build elevated if you're out of space and you can't take a, a car lane or a bike lane or a pedestrian lane away. You can elevate it. You can go at grade, which is what most of our customers prefer. You can trench or tunnel, or you can do a mix and match. And that's kind of the point. We have one technology that operates on an entire, of a huge variety, 30 or 40 different infrastructure elements, so you can Lego block your own system together. Our system does not work the way a train works. Yes, we can deploy a line in the traditional sense, a line on a map and vehicles go up and down, but we work best as a mesh network. And what I mean by a mesh network is really this idea that because we're so inexpensive, we're $10 million per kilometer, whereas trains are hundreds of millions of dollars per kilometer, you can actually afford to build as much as you need. And when you can afford to build as much as you need, you no longer have to constrain yourself to what is the shortest line that I can build. I can build an entire network. I can go almost on every street corner. Or if my city is a grid, I can go to every block. And then I can get on and off the network anywhere I want, which is phenomenal. And so we operate best as a mesh network. Think of us as packetizing people. The IP networks, they packetize data. Data gets routed intelligently from point A to point B. But anywhere on the network gets you data off the network. We do exactly the same thing. It's where we drew some inspiration. The way our system works is pretty simple. We have different actors in a play, and all of them are carefully coordinated with our AI. And that is the core focus of our company. We are not vehicle producers. We're not Tesla in that sense. Uh, lots of companies know how to build low-cost commodity electric vehicles. So we're not doing that. We work with partners, and I'll get into those in a moment. And in the same way we don't produce vehicles, we clearly don't produce infrastructure. What we actually focus on is the software, the operating system that makes this entire thing work. And so we, th we think of this as, an, as an, a play, and we have actors in the play. And the actors are what you see on the screen. It starts with the vehicles, of course. We have sections of road, and we have boarding zones, and we have garages where the vehicles are stored, charged, cleaned, and so forth. And we have a central management system that coordinates everything. And of course, we have users. And when you tie all this AI together, what you realize is actually that there are two fundamental capabilities that make this work. And before I explain what they are, let me be clear. This idea is not one we invented. This idea is older than I am. It's at least 60 years old. Big companies around the world have tried to do this. Boeing, Raytheon, Artemis in France, many companies have tried to chase this dream of cheaper infrastructure and profitable mass transit. 
and ultra high capacity mass transit, but no one could make it work. And the reason why is that disaggregation and continuous flow is very difficult to achieve. What you see in the top animation called boarding zones on the screen is how we carefully coordinate boarding zones. What you see in the middle is how we carefully coordinate trunk lines to guarantee continuous flow so that you can disembark, disengage from the trunk line, pull over, stop, drop someone off, pick them up, and re-merge without having to interrupt the flow of traffic. That's very important because if you think of an Uber or a taxi or even a train, when they stop, you've blocked the entire throughput of that lane or the train tracks. We don't do that. And if you zoom way out to the entire system, AI load balancing is required to make sure that nobody waits, in our case, more than 21 seconds. So even in the worst case where a stadium unloads or the Empire State Building unloads and everybody gets out, our worst case is 21 second wait time. And that's because we have AI not just at the vehicles doing coordination that I discussed earlier, but also load balancing across the entire system. And this is kind of neat from a technical perspective because our technology plans each vehicle's trajectory in space and in time. And to do that, we drew inspiration from air traffic control systems. I don't know if anybody knows this. Uh, I'm a pilot, so I'm, I was born sort of into this world. No plane ever takes off until down the time tunnel you have a guaranteed landing spot. So planes are both controlled in three dimensions and in the linear dimension of time. We do the same thing. When our doors close and our vehicle moves out, it already has a guaranteed spot down the time tunnel because we know where you're going to go. And if you decide to change your mind halfway through, you want to go somewhere else, you can absolutely do that. The recalculation is done and a new trajectory is planned. We do that for thousands of vehicles at the same time. That's hard to do. So that's a bit how it works. But let me talk about the economics because at the end of the day, this is what it's all about. Today, if you need a mass transit system, if you're a city or a municipality, a government, you have these choices and that's it. You can buy a heavy rail like we have here in Hong Kong. You can buy a light rail like we have in San Francisco, which is the same thing, just lower capacity. Or in some cases, you can buy a BRT, a bus rapid transit. And when you think about the economics, you think about two things, CapEx and OpEx. How much does it cost to build and how much does it cost to operate? Heavy rail is nearly a billion dollars per mile, which is insane, but these are the numbers we're used to. Our worst case, which is a raised system, with the vehicle cost is $16 million per mile. OPEX is calculated in dollars per person per mile traveled. Trains at best, when they are shoulder to shoulder crush loaded, achieve roughly 35 to 40 cents. We are half of that. And that's where our profit margin comes from. As you go down the capacity ladder from heavy rail to light rail to bus, the capex comes down. That's why they invented light rail and BRT, to bring the sticker price down. But your opex goes up because you're paying for humans to drive trains or buses, but they're moving fewer people. BRT, buses are the cheapest to buy, but the most expensive to operate. Our costs, as I said before, are the same regardless of the size of the system. That has never been seen before in transportation. Now, when we talk about market size, uh, this is the only thing I actually remember from my MBA education, what I'm about to share. There are 4,500 cities on Earth today of a size and density that require a mass transit system to deal with commuting traffic, 4,500. This is how many cities have rail, 178. 178 cities on planet Earth have a rail solution. Over 4,000 need it, but don't have it because they cannot afford it. That's more than 95% of a market that is underserved. And so what I learned from MBA school is very simple. The lower your cost, the greater your applicable market, right? Well, this is what we look like. I picked four infrastructure elements, painted lines on a road, curbed separated lanes, walled off corridors, and of course a raised roadway. And apologies for mixing up miles and kilometers. But you can see our costs are paltry small compared to rail. And that's how we're going to target the entire market. And that's why we started the company. We are not about selling mass transit systems to only first world nations. We don't want to leave the other 6 billion people on Earth behind. The continent of Africa has hundreds of cities that require a rail system. Only three have rail. We want to go into those cities. So how many billions of dollars does this take? 
It actually requires very, very little. Our core value proposition is a software operating system that makes Glideways work. And from the beginning, we made the decision to only use off-the-shelf commodity hardware, both for the vehicle and for everything else, the infrastructure, communications, and so forth. And this means we can leverage a global supply chain for the vehicles, infrastructure, and all the other components. And so these are just some of the partners we work with. Some of the names you'll recognize, these are big companies, multi-billion dollar companies that know how to build the components we need, and we leverage that. For us, we're a software company. Yes, we're doing mass transit, but fundamentally, from a cost base, we're a software company. Now, I said to you, we are in stealth mode, and we're a very young company. We have not even been around four years. I founded the company three and a half years ago. Already, we have customers in Japan and in the United States and several other countries. Uh, and this is despite us trying to remain in stealth mode. But our business model is very simple. We sell a ride, and our operating cost is less than the revenue we get, and we keep whatever is left over. That is our business model, pretty straightforward. We have another business model that works in some areas too, particularly Japan, where we license the technology. Think of us like Microsoft. Microsoft licenses an operating system onto other people's computers, and that's how they make money. We do the same thing. However, there's something else we do that is, for me, extremely exciting. Our customers, both public and private, pay for the infrastructure that we get to use exclusively to deliver a service. We as a company never even see the financial transaction for the infrastructure, and in some cases, even the vehicle fleet. And our operating contracts are typically 30 years and sometimes as long as 50 years. That means we have downside protected, guaranteed recurring revenue streams for decades. And that means every sale for us, every contract we get, is worth percentages of billions of dollars. A couple hundred million up to a billion per customer. And I told you before, there's over 4,000 cities we can target. I'll be happy with 1% of that or 10% of that. And then, of course, there's a private market. The customer traction we have is already overwhelming us. Uh, and what you see in the, I think, upper left-hand corner image is one I'm going to call up in a moment. That's where we're based. We're based in San Francisco, California. And we have a mix of public and private customers just in the Bay Area. And something else is happening quite, that's very, very interesting for us, which is what we call the network effect. And the network effect is a description that we use to describe both a barrier to competition and a value add that we bring, which is, it's fine if I sell to Facebook and to San Francisco and maybe Palo Alto, but what if I interconnected them? Think of every system as a node on a network. And every time I add a node on the network, the value goes up for everyone because anybody can get on and off the network at any point and place. And we make more money the more people we move, so we're inherently motivated to do that. And what you get, actually, when you put all that together is the world's largest single transportation system ever conceived. Now, we are still a startup and a young one at that, as I mentioned before. And like any startup, we're always raising money to scale our technology. And our strategy for managing scale is to leverage our partners, like I showed you before on the prior slide, so that we can focus on our core value, which is software. And what you see on the screen is what our software can create in terms of value. This is one project. We call this about a medium project. And the, the baseline that we use is we say we're not going to raise ticket prices over whatever mass transit fares are common in any given market. In the US and Silicon Valley, that happens to be about 30 cents per kilometer. And so if you look at the left, our cost base is 18 cents per kilometer, and that includes depreciation. The actual cash, cash cost for us to operate per kilometer is 12 cents. We keep the rest, and that's where our EBITDA margins come from. That translates into, for this particular system, a $40 million a year annual service contract for our, our portion of the business for 30 years with growth. And so when you compare that to what this particular customer would be paying if they were to use a rail solution, you can see the difference. We're several hundred million, a rail system would have been several billion. And for us, the lifetime value over the 30-year contract, which is very likely to be renewed, is nearly three quarters of a billion dollars. And that's just one customer, and a relatively small one. So 
So this is the image I showed you before. This is where we are commercially uh, in Silicon Valley. It's quite big. It's getting bigger. We hope to do a lot more. But I think the, the network effect can be looked at in a slightly different way. Uh, and for this, I want to bring up one of our other customer engagements, Kyoto, Japan. And Kyoto is not a big city. It's about the size of San Francisco in terms of population, but it's a lot more dense. It's a very challenging city to deal with. And they have been wanting to deploy more trains, but have never been able to. Both economically, they're infeasible, and physically, they do not fit in the city. And so when they heard of us, they became very, very excited. And they're starting with six of our systems, six. And each system is small. It's a couple hundred vehicles. It's between five and 10 kilometers per system. And there's six of them spread around the city, targeting the local traffic hotspots. And that's what they call a pilot. It's about $1.8 billion in capital expense. And the idea is to leverage our ability to scale incrementally so that once those six are up and running and they're working and people are happy, that they can slowly expand the size and the coverage of each of those six systems until ultimately they bump into each other and it becomes one gigantic system where you can get on and off anywhere on the network. So that's another way the network effect actually works really, really well for us with, with one single customer. And so ultimately, every company is built on beliefs, or at least I believe every company should be built on beliefs. And this is ours. Uh, and this is really important to us. Our belief is that a developed country is not a place where you elevate poor people to be able to afford vehicles, but rather where the rich people choose to use public transportation. In the United States, this is an unheard of concept. We're awfully far behind the curve here. But this is what we believe, mass transit for all 7 billion people. And just think about the consequences of success here. How much prosperity around the world can we stimulate by moving labor and goods? Think of Jakarta or Mexico City, where it takes four hours to travel two or three kilometers. Access to housing, access to employment, access to healthcare, all of it is tied to transportation. And at the moment, mass transit is privy to very, very few cities, less than 200. And so that's our target. And so every decision we made was not about maximizing profit. When you're 90% cheaper than the alternative, you don't have to price yourself at 90% cheaper. You can price yourself at 50% cheaper and carry home a lot of cash. But we deliberately made decisions not to do that because this is our goal. It'll take a, t take a while to get there, but we think we can. Um, it should be fun. So I hope that's interesting. I'm, I've left a lot of detail out. I want to do a Q&A, and I'm happy to see people later. But uh, that's what we're doing. It's a little bit of a different take on mass transit. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Sure. Um, Mark's got a few spaces left for dinner tonight, if anybody uh, would like to, to, to follow up, and also some uh, space tomorrow afternoon, so um, you feel free, um, if you'd like to, to book a meeting with Mark uh, with the team at the back of the, the, the hall. Um, I'm going to start off with the, with the first question. So, I mean, amazing concept, but when you go and pitch these systems to uh, governments who, you know, are thinking about putting in a light rail system, I mean, what are the, what are the biggest challenges? What's the biggest pushback? Yeah. Um, you know, from, from, from the buyer's side um, to, to this proposal, which looks on paper just so, so convincing. Yeah, the economics usually speak for themselves. Um, but what we find is that all of our potential customers that we speak with, they're acutely aware of this problem, uh, that the economics and the solutions available for a mass transit solution today are not going to meet their needs, either because they can't afford it or it's too disruptive, too big, and so on and so forth, too inflexible. So we don't have any problems there, and of course our economics on paper sound great. So they ask, well, how do you execute this? And so we go through the explanation of saying, look, it's bike lanes, whether they're at grade or raised. And they say, okay, well, we know how to build bike lanes. Cities build bike lanes all the time. And we say, well, let's, let's talk about the vehicle, the second major component. It doesn't go fast, it doesn't go far, it's not that big. It's kind of a glorified golf cart with air conditioning, if you will. And the autonomous technology has been proven for at least two to three decades already. So that's not a problem. And when we talk about who builds our infrastructure, which is Obayashi, Acom, Shimic, all the companies around the world that do infrastructure, they say, yeah, okay, I believe that. 
And when we talk about the vehicle and they get over the fact that yeah, it's not, uh, a, not a Tesla, it's a fairly commodity electric vehicle, which is by design, then they say, well, who manufactures it? And we say, well, look, our vehicle manufacturers are Panasonic, Mitsubishi, and Suzuki, and we're going to try to bring as many into the mix as we possibly can. They say, yeah, okay, they know how to build vehicles. So what about the software? And that's where we say, aha, that is the one thing that is unique to us, and boy, did we patent it. And then we go through several layers of demonstration, both in simulation, where we take their actual demand data, and they usually pay us to do this, to simulate the proposed system for them, and show that we can meet all the edge cases and all the demand, even with all the worst possible edge cases you could throw at it. And then we take it into the real world. And so we have both scaled and full-scale prototypes that actually move real vehicles to show. And so when you stitch those three things together, people say, oh, look, this can be done. I don't know if you can execute it, but it can be done. And so that moves us from the, uh, of a risk profile from an unproven concept that sounds great on paper to a, a fairly complicated concept that has the constituents already developed and proven. And since we're not putting shovels in the ground, the big construction companies are doing that, the conversation usually shifts to them and say, can you build this? And of course they say yes. And so shovels are in the ground on our first systems uh, Q1 of next year. And we expect to build up very, very quickly after that, uh, as quickly as we can. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. You got any questions from the floor? Mary at the front. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, don't you still have the commuter problem that everybody wants to use it at the same time? And then secondly, do your OPEX costs, um, do they depend on some level of capacity utilization? Those are great questions. So yeah, absolutely, we, we have the commuting problem. However, because we're not concentrated into these singularities called a train station, where your passenger flux is measured in the thousands of people, we spread the problem out in space. So we have boarding zones every 100 meters, every 200 meters which is very, very close to where people live. So first of all, we spread the problem out in space and in time. Not everybody has to come to one train station or one glideway station. That's not how it works. And so because of that, the individual passenger flux at any given boarding zone is really, really low because we have many of them. So that's how we solve that problem. The next question becomes, well, if I can get the vehicles onto the network, can I have a, a trunk line that can move them all? And of course, that's what we can do as well with continuous flow. And the same is true for the destination. We don't dump everybody all at the same time in one building or one location because not everybody works at the same building. So we have boarding zones surrounding all the main buildings or at least all the main areas in a financial district or, or a central business district. So that's kind of how, how we think about it. Again, it's very counterintuitive. It's the exact opposite of what a train system or a traditional system does, which is aggregation and concentration, which gives you real challenges of passenger flux and people flux. We definitely have, uh, to your second question, we definitely have break-even points, but they're really low. They're measured in demand in terms of how many people per hour in the hundreds of people, meaning we are economically viable even moving a few hundred people, which is nowhere even close to mass transit uh, demands. And again, we move people in the morning at night predominantly. Those are peak demands and not and a little bit during the day, but at night most people sleep. And so that's when we can take our vehicles home, recharge them, clean them, fix them. Uh, but the vehicles are basically underutilized when most people are asleep. And so we've been asking ourselves, what do we do with this capital infrastructure, whether we own it or not, what do we do with it? And uh, economically, we don't have to do anything with it, but imagine if we move people during the day in packages at night. And at that point, I have an ultra-high capacity, rapid, widely coveraged uh, transit system in any city that I can license to a parcel carrier, a FedEx, an Amazon, a UPS, a DHL, and so forth. And that's one of the things we're also actively involved in. Yeah, thanks for that question. Gentleman. Yeah, I, I guess that sort of speaks to my question. You seem to have the software really worked out. Just on the hardware side, like what kind of batteries technology you're using, and then how do you convince the cities, okay, you need a place to have these um, recharge, you have to have a place to fix them, you have to have a place, uh, you actually need more than you need in order to keep the flux going. So can you speak a little bit about the hardware, and I guess, convincing cities that they can actually transport packages when things are off peak times actually would maybe help make the investment worthwhile, so. Sure, so when it comes to technology, we're actually fairly agnostic. Uh, we specify the vehicle rather than design the vehicle to leverage 
our manufacturer's supply chain efficiencies, and they may be different from company to company. Because we don't go very fast, and because we don't go very far, we have the opposite opportunity or problem that Tesla does, where they have to both go fast and far. And so the batteries we can use can be the cheapest commodity battery chemistries you can buy on the market. Uh, in terms of size, if, if any, for those of you who are, who are familiar with battery sizes, some of our battery packs are as small as 15 kilowatt hours, and we can carry as much as 50 kilowatt hours. And really, the, the reason why there's a, a band is that there's a bit of an economic balance between how many times do you recharge a battery versus carry on an entire 24-hour cycle without a recharge. So the battery is a great example where we, we don't require premium technologies. We don't require LiDAR. LiDAR is really expensive, and it's a new technology. We don't need that. We use radar, which has been around for decades. Uh, we use other sensors that have been around for decades. So in the same way our batteries are commodity batteries, every other component from compute to HVAC to propulsion and everything, the power electronics, they're all commodity stuff, and that was done by design. So that's a little bit about the vehicle. Uh, what, what was the second question? Oh, the, the maintenance. So for us, <clears throat> our maintenance where we charge, clean, and repair vehicles or service vehicles is literally a garage, a parking garage. We don't need a train depot, which is several acres large, because our vehicles are smaller. And as a result of that, some of our customers quite literally have city-owned parking garages, and they give us some of the floors in there. And from a recharging perspective, we don't use anything exotic, at least not yet. We don't use induction charging. We don't use robotics. People plug them in. The vehicle comes in, they're plugged in. The vehicles are sprayed down if they're dirty, tires are replaced, whatever needs to be done. And later, yes, we can optimize by automating that, but we don't need to nor want to. We want to de-risk our execution as much as possible. So think of our systems being supported by one or two or four or eight garages. That depends on the size of the system and how many vehicles we have. And that's where they're cleaned and recharged and maintained. So convincing a city to either let us build a garage or give us a garage versus a train depot, which is massive, is usually pretty easy to do. Yeah, yeah hi. Um, uh, two questions. Uh, one, um, curious as to uh, the reaction of, let's say, a city like Singapore uh, to your solution, because they're pretty committed to limit the number of uh, cars on the road. Um, and also, what kind of lead distance do you need, let's say in cities where there is a fair bit of uh, uh, you know, mass transit which is already there, but there's still a last mile problem of how people get to that mass transit point, which is still uh, quite problematic, right? Yeah. So what kind of lead distance do you need for your model to be uh, uh, operating efficiently and profitably? So with regard to Singapore, it's very near and dear to my heart, uh, that country, because I lived there about a third of my life. Um, so Singapore is aware of what we're doing, and they, they take a perspective that's quite common to most governments, municipalities, and, and frankly countries, which is that the moment infrastructure is discussed, your risk appetite falls to effectively <laughs> zero, um, because the capital is so high, whatever you're building. And so what we found is a stratification of our, of our customer base. Some are so risk averse, they say, hey, look, we'll buy it because we love it, the value proposition makes sense, but only when it's up and running in at least one or five other cities that I can go to and visit. And the safety has been proven, the efficacy and the economics have been proven. And Singapore very much fits in that category, and, and characteristically, that's not surprising. Um, but we're just a few years away from that. Um, so that's the Singaporean question. The, the question around the last mile is exactly where we thrive. I speak and I presented this to you in the concept of a train replacement. Don't build a train, build a glideway system. And that's what we designed it for, which is the, the most challenging thing. However, we can coexist with rail or any other system very, very well. And in fact, a lot of our Silicon Valley um, customer bases are not about replacing a train. They're about connecting the train over here with the destination over there. And Facebook is a great example of that. Facebook has a campus in Menlo Park where they have nearly 20,000 employees, and they're planning to triple that population over the next two to three years. They're going to hit about 60,000 employees, and they're building the buildings right now to support that. And their campus is a few kilometers long. But the problem they have is they cannot get people to work or back home. All the roads are congested. If anybody has been to Silicon Valley during rush hour, it's an absolute nightmare. 
And so in 2015, Facebook made the decision publicly, and this is all public information uh, that I'm disclosing, to build their own train to help get people to work. And they were gonna, they, were, they hired a, a, a massive infrastructure development company called Plenary Group to do that, to design and build the train system. And it's only when the costs materialized at $4 billion of CapEx and over $100 million a year in OPEX subsidy did they say, well, time out, we can't do this. And of course, that's when we came into the story and we said, well, we're not four billion, we're a couple hundred million. And so that system that they were going to design that we are now working with is purely to connect two train systems, the BART and the Caltrain, if, if anybody's familiar with that area, together so that people can come out of the train networks, that's where the, the train networks terminate, and they can come into Palo Alto and Menlo Park to Facebook. And so we work great as a last mile extension or a connector between system A and system B. Uh, we thrive there because again, our unit economics work even if we're very, very small. And then we can expand incrementally from there. And in fact, frankly, I prefer that uh, because we're still a young company. So taking on an entire city is a bit of a, uh, would keep me up at night, to put it bluntly. Yeah. Hi, um, I love your idea. It sounds incredibly efficient and productive and um, the business model sounds compelling. Thanks. I'm worried about the messiness of the people that are going to be using it. <laughs> um, judging by the London Underground at sort of late on a Saturday night, um, you're going to be left with a lot of empty McDonald's, um, or not empty McDonald's, et cetera. How do you deal with people refusing to get off, people refusing to get on, um, people leaving stuff behind, you know, the general vagaries of human life? Yeah, well, let me explain that. Um... Oh, and the safety of women. Yes, well that, so I was actually gonna start there. Um, when I got into this, I knew nothing about mass transit and I didn't know what people do on existing mass transit. Uh, it's quite shocking and I can't actually in a public forum explain what I'm aware of because it's just not appropriate to do so. Um, so we have to absolutely deal with that but let me talk about safety first. First of all, we do not have a train that unloads several hundred people all at once that give pickpocketers and thieves an opportunity, a pre-scheduled opportunity to invade and steal. Our vehicles are unscheduled uh, and we disperse the boarding zone, the boarding and unboarding over a wide period of time, uh, space and time. Secondly, once the doors close, we guarantee chain of custody of the vehicle until it gets to its destination. So we know exactly where the vehicle is, we know exactly what's happening with the vehicle during that journey, which makes it extremely safe because there's zero ride sharing. We do not share rides. Yes, there are two seats. You can bring in four, your entire family of five if you wish, but there's no ride sharing by design. And so as a result of that, you're never forced with strangers. So that's how we address that. If you need multiple vehicles because your party size is 10 people, the vehicles come together, they platoon together, they arrive together as well. That's how we deal with that. And then we make the insides of our vehicles hosable. You have to be able to take a pressure washer and in 30 seconds clean out all the material you find inside the vehicle. Um, and that's done deliberately. Now it's interesting, we have one customer in Japan that actually wants a very premium vehicle, leather seats, very business class or first class uh, customer experience. They're gonna have to deal with it slightly differently, but they have a very discreet customer base uh, that will use it, and so I think they'll be protected from it. But yeah, people start fires in, in mass transit systems. They defecate in mass transit systems. So you have to deal with that in the same way everybody deals with it, which is a power hose. Uh, and so when we, our vehicles come home, whether they're not being used or it's at the end of the day, they're not just recharged, but they're washed out. And think of us as a rental car company. You know, the rental cars come home, they're fueled, they're cleaned, fixed if necessary, and then they're parked and ready for service again. So we kind of deploy the same mindset. Um, did, I, did I capture all of your, your questions? Ah. Yeah, dealing with dirty or broken mass transit systems is a known uh, science, it's a known industry. And so we bring in a lot of those statistics from our customers, because a customer in Jakarta is very different from a customer base in the United States or Europe or, or anywhere in North Asia. And so we rely on, on our customers to give us that information because they have that information. Um, but ultimately, it's about proving it. Uh, and so for us, again, we can do things that a train can't do. We can start with a commercial pilot that's tiny to see what actually happens. There's something else we do too, which is that our vehicles flow around each other. So if your vehicle is parked and you're about to get in, and let's say you're an elderly person and you drop all your groceries and you need several minutes to pick them up, no problem. Take as long as you need. Our system flows around you. 
Unlike a train or a taxi or an Uber, when it's parked, it's blocked the entire lane until you start moving again. You can't go around a train, not easily. And you can't go around a car, particularly if there's traffic, not easily. For us, we do offline disembarkation. So you can take as much time as you want, which also means when we have a vehicle failure, which for certain we will, yes, that vehicle passenger will be inconvenienced, but the rest of the system is robust and can move and flow around it. So we start with small pilots to test and validate and see what happens, if you will, and then expand once we're comfortable to do so. And we can do that because it's economically viable when we're small. Sorry, two questions. One, just following on what you just said just then, how, if, you, if you're parking off lane, don't you have to have twice as much space? I yeah. don't quite understand how that works. So the first okay. question. And the second question is, you know, it, it's great that you're, the only thing you're providing is the software, everything else can be made by everybody else. To what extent, I know you've got patents, et cetera, but to what extent is your software so unique that it couldn't be just replicated everything, this is just a great idea, I wish, I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, I should have thought of that. Now I've thought of it because I've just stolen it from you. Yeah. Uh, I live in Asia where, you know, we're not very good at uh, doing these things. So do you see a world where, you know, China builds 300 of these things overnight and then people go, actually, I like the Chinese one, so they've proved it, so I'll, I'll buy their one. I mean, how, how do you, from a business point of view, you, know, you might say you've got IP protection, but how, how special is that IP? I mean, uh, that that's really was, was my main question, but obviously the, the double parking would be helpful as well. Thanks. So yeah, we so go, we're going to give a short answer to that one, Mark, and, and if we need to, we'll take it outside afterwards. Our lanes are small. They're one and a half meters wide. So when we need multiple lanes for offline disembarkation and parking, at most we're taking up one or two car, lengths, uh, car lanes width of space. A train is multiple times bigger than that. So even though, yes, we do need an auxiliary lane to slow down and a parking spot over here and then to remerge later, the overall space we require is less than half of any other mass transit system to do the same job. So that's how we just think about it. We just scaled the problem down in size. On top of that, we can do stacked where the vehicles move up here and stop down here, particularly in cities that are space constrained. So now we're very, very narrow. We just go up in, in height. And again, we can do that because we're very small and light. The defensibility question is a great one. Yes, we have patents. Yes, it is very hard to do this. It took several PhDs, multiple years to do the AI coding, if you will, to build the operating system, but anybody can do that. I don't care. Today, 178 cities spend $3 trillion every year on rail. That's less than 5% of the market is spending more money than the entire global car market combined. If I go from 5% market penetration to 50%, how big is that market? If I have 10% of that, I'm okay. The last comment I would make there, though, is the network effect, which I talked about before, which is if I sell a system to this city and I sell a system over there and I interconnect them with a 30-year contract, what does the other city next door want to do? Do they want to plug into my system or get a proprietary system from someone else? So we have first mover advantage, a land and expand model, but we welcome 20 other competitors. We just, there's no way we can handle it. We're a startup company. Yeah, the world needs us, so sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we've, we've run out of time. Thank but, you. Uh, as mentioned, Mark, Mark's around if, uh, if you have any further follow-up. But uh, please join me in thanking uh, Mark Seeger. Thank you. Colleagues. Thank you, Damien. Really appreciate that.